She's got she's got three hours of the best sermon. No, not gonna happen. I'm just kidding. Uh, men, if you're here for the first time, uh, our church service is about 60 minutes long, so you can relax now that you know. Um, but in those 60 minutes, God does something incredible every single week. And so I know I just answered the question for the guys and the guys are like, thank you. Now I can relax. Um, but there's something that God wants to do in your life uh, today. And so, um, yeah. yeah, I'll give it over to Pastor Aaron. Hey, parents, we're going to invite you on stage in just a moment. But before we do, we just want to share a few thoughts with you guys. Um, there's something that people have coined the 414 window, and that is the ages when kids are most receptive to hearing the gospel of Christ and living lives on purpose for Jesus. And so if a child can come into an authentic relationship with Christ in that time, not only will, will their lives be changed, but their communities are going to be transformed and the world around them as well. And so we recognize right now that a biblical worldview is really important to awaking in a generation. Um, and if we look at history, in Europe in the 1900s, 90% of Christians lived in the European nations of the world. And 86% of kids that time went to Sunday school. 86% of kids went to Sunday school in the whole nation. Um, 100 years later, only 4% do. And you can see the decline of what's happened. And the reason this is important to us, that, that kids are trained up in the house of the Lord, you got to recognize that um, there was a marketing conference a few years ago that showed people that Fortune 500 companies actually have a marketing strategy to reach your kids by the age they are eight through tribalism, which is like loyalty to a specific social group, often at the discrimination of other social groups, um, rebellion, and sexuality. By age eight, they're targeting your kids in the goal that 15 years later, they'll be the consumers buying their products. This is not a passive plan, it's strategic. And so we need to be strategic in the things of the Lord so that our kids have foundations that matter as well. And that matter for eternity. And if the, en if the enemy has been clever with our kids, uh, I don't think that the church needs to be unclever. And so I think there's a lot more in us that we're not tapping into and a lot more in the house of God and a lot more in the God's word that we just need to get more intentional about it. So. Proverbs 22 in the message uh, paraphrase says, point your kids in the right direction. When they're old, they won't be lost. Well, that's a promise, parent. Point your kids in the right direction. When they're old, they will not be lost. The word of God never comes back empty. And so um, we had a great men's breakfast yesterday. Uh, we love getting the guys together uh, venue church because, I mean, the, the guys of this church are awesome, engaged in the gospel. Yes. But I said, you know what? Don't worry about our kids' generation. Do not worry about the generation to come in spite of the craziness of the world right now. I know it's, I, I know it's crazy. I, I have kids in the world right now. Don't be afraid of the next generation. There's going to be a grace of God on them for their generation. They're going to be the leaders of that generation. They're going to save the world from the crazy that's going on and bring them to the house of the Lord. And so we're not afraid for the next generation. We just got to get it right. We got to train the kids up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So... So one thing that um, one thing that we need to do is we need to emulate our children from lies with the truth. Now the thing about the truth is it's not a personal truth. I'm not talking about like well my personal truth. Okay, that's not really a thing. Truth is truth. You don't have a personal gravity relationship with gravity. Are you feeling me, Venue Church? Like there's not a personal thing you get. If you fall, it's gonna hurt, or you can fly. There's principles with the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You, you immunize your kids not by freaking out about the lies, but you immunize your kids to lies and all the craziness by speaking the truth to them. And so you have to say, like, no, this is the way, this is the direction of your life. This is what God has to say about this issue. This is what God has to say about you. This is who you are. And so uh, when we do that, we don't need to study all the lies out there. Then when they taste a lie out there, they'll be like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. That's weird. That doesn't feel right. And so, uh, yeah, and the, and the next thing I would say is um, the world is in self-destruct mode right now. Don't be afraid of that. Just teach your kids how to build. Mm. Teach them how to build. They'll hang out with the right crowd if they're building something. Right. And the last thing that I just wanted to teach before I uh, let Pastor Aaron do all the teaching is um, teach them to be kind but not nice. Now, now well, I know that nice is like the Canadian standard of behavior. But we're so nice that we'll watch somebody play in the street where cars are. And we're so nice that we won't get them off of the street. That's how nice we are. 
So when I say be kind, I mean be kind like Jesus did. And sometimes we got to tackle our kids off of the road and be like, did you see that car? And so, but listen, the truth hurts in those scenarios, but you have to do what's right by your kids. You have to do what's right, not just by your kids. You're responsible for the kids uh, around you, the parents around you as well. This is a village. This is the house of the Lord. And we are, we take responsibility with you. And so I just want to say that let's be kind like Jesus was kind and compassionate, but let's not be so nice that we lie and that we lack the courage to like speak up when somebody's wrecking their lives, that we actually are kind enough to like, Hey, I don't think you should live like that. I think that God has a better plan for you. Yes. All right. That's what I had. That's all I got. Okay. So parents, we're going to call you up on stage. You can bring your families up with you. Um, yeah. So do it. You do it. You're doing the thing. Okay, yeah. Okay. So first up, we have Ivory and Violet Morrison with their parents, Dallas and Mackenzie. Come on, Dallas and Mackenzie. Where are those kids? You guys here? Where are those kids at? There they are. Just come on up here. Just come on up and we'll just, I don't know, what are we going to do? Just go like from here across the stage. Sure, sounds great. Just start filling the stage up. Come on up, guys. Next, we have Mark and Aaron, uh, parents of Piper Sheck. Come on up, Aaron. We have Teresa and Ian, parents of Arabella O'Neill. Just come on up, we'll arrange come on up, you as Teresa. we go. Come on, guys, yeah. We got Amy, mom of Lennox Lambert. Just come on up, it'll be chaos. We'll just get you Come on up, hey, Amy. Uh, next, we're dedicating Ruby, <laughs> Thackeray, Garrett, and Ashley. Come, come on, on up here. and bring up Ruby. Right here. Here, in the middle, anywhere you want to stand. Anywhere you want to stand. We have Farai and Chennai, parents of Malachi. Mwambira. Yeah, come on, come on up. up. Uh, we have Danielle and Steve, the parents of Colton Swanson, Eloise Swanson, and Quillen Swanson. Oh, guys. Come on up, Danielle. And then we have uh, Fola and Doyen, parents of Shogu Oludiran, and uh, Folu, or David Oludiran. Are you guys here? There we are. Come on, awesome. you guys, come on, come on up. up. We need a bigger stage. We also might need a bigger church, so pray for pastor. All right. Is everybody here? No, oh. coming up. Oh, yeah. Come on up, you guys. That is a sparkly dress. You look lovely. Woo. Come on up, you guys. Awesome. Awesome. All right. That's perfect, you guys. Paw Patrol. I used to think that Paw Patrol was Paw Patrol. Yeah, anyways, that's my life. Um, Pastor Aaron, you're supposed to be over here, I think. All right. Now, I'm going to invite uh, my kids, because uh, my parents are here. This is Pastor Richard and Beth. They're retired right now, but we call them Pastor out of honor. And so, and my kids, whoever's not serving right now, uh, my kids, I'd like you on stage as well, because we're going to pray a blessing just to, as a family over families today. So, are you the only one who's not serving right now? Oh. That's a good problem to have, everybody. I'm, I'm going to give a challenge to the parents right now. Um, and this is the challenge, because we're going to challenge you, and then we're going to challenge the congregation. We're going to say, like, this is your part. Only you can do this part. And then we're going to say, but this is the part that the, the congregation needs to, to play in. Even with my kids being partially here, partially here. She is all here. She is wholly here. But our kids are serving. And I would challenge you, if you want to see your kids serving in the house of God, you want longevity in Christianity. Give and serve. You want to see them on stage here one day? Well, you've got to do it first. And, and that's one thing that Pastor Aaron and I have done in our families. We have shown our kids what serving and giving looks like. And, uh, and they are in the house of the Lord. And it is as much, if not more so, their house. That's how they feel about it, uh, as it is ours. And, and uh, uh, I would just give you that challenge as well. Um, or you can be the parents that everybody hears about in baptisms 20 years from now. When they're like, well, mom and dad went to church, but they never got involved. And I'm like, I don't want that to be you. I want them to be like, my mom and dad showed me the gospel. I was, I knew what I was here for. So now your commitment to, to parents, this is a little weird. I'm going to just talk like this video people figure it out. Okay. Um, show them how to connect with God. Their purpose is to connect with God and with people. You got to show them how to do that. Don't wait for somebody else to show them. That's our job. That's your job as parents to show them how to connect with God and people. And I would say, here's what I just want to challenge you with. The best family event is God's house. That is our family. That's what we do as a family. Like we might go as a family into something else, but this is our family event every single week. This is where we do family here. So, um, then I would say things like you got to teach your children generosity and giving. 
We don't want your kids ever to struggle uh, being blessed by the Lord, struggle in a place where the Lord can't bless them. And so we would say, like, learn how to give and tithe and give a tenth to the Lord so that your kids don't have that same struggle that you had. My parents uh, did that so that I never struggled. And, and the Lord always took care of us financially. It's one of those things that we don't ever want to see the kids of God suffering want and lack. And God has a plan for that. The other thing I would say is if you don't check them into kids, don't expect them to go to youth. And if they don't go to youth, don't expect them to go to church. And uh, that's part of the thing. And don't, don't expect them to go there if you won't go to small group. So I'm just going to be honest about it. I'm going to say that's how we show them. I go to, we go to group. We have our people. And when they go to, if they don't go to kids, then they're not going to meet the kids that are going to be in junior youth. And then they're not going to meet the kids in junior youth that they go through life with. Because you don't want them going through life just with kids at school. You want them going through life with the kids at house. These are their like best friends and their closest friends. And um, 80% of kids in high school that have a job in church stay in church. And that's across any church. And this is a great church. I think our percentage here would be a lot higher than that. So 80% of kids with jobs in church, we teach them how to serve. We show them how to serve. So. And stay humble and correct correctable. These are not your children. They belong to the Lord. My children are not mine. They belong to the Lord, but I will answer for them. That places a fear of the Lord in my life. Like, I better get this right. I better work hard. I better uh, make sure. I love this truck. That's awesome. Anyways, I better make sure that I get it right. I stay teachable. I stay correctable. I ask people ahead of me in the journey in the family of God. I get support. I get love. I get uh, correction from all those sources. And all those sources are right here. Now, um, Pastor Aaron, I want you to challenge our church family. Okay, so church, this is why our job is to come alongside the parents, not to interfere, but to encourage, to challenge, to support. Maybe not always to agree with them, uh, because the child's destiny is paramount here. And also, if disaster falls on these families, we're going to step in and help. We are committed to them. And if things go down in your life, we're not all going down. And so we're going to come and walk beside you guys. And we're going to be there with you guys through no matter what comes, no matter what happens, because God is great and he is faithful. And so we are here with you through the journeys of life, guys. And we want you to know that it's not just up to your extended family to help take care of those children. This body, if something happens to you, this body will see that your children reach their destiny. Uh, if you commit them to the house of the Lord, that is our responsibility right now. And we take that. We don't take that very lightly. Yeah, that's probably far enough. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> All right, go, Pastor Aaron, are you doing more? No. Nope. Oh, we're, we're there. Okay, that's our challenge. All right. Church, are we good for that? Yes. Okay. Now let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, Lord, our church exists to disrupt the work of the enemy in the world, to bring the lost and confused to the saving power of the Lord Jesus, to build the kingdom of God. Let every boy and girl presented to the Lord today fulfill the Lord's design and call on their lives. Let them set the captive free in our nation, O oh God, those bound by sin and greed and lust, Father, and lies, Lord. Let them be the ones that set their generation free. Let every mother and father submit to work for and believe in God's work in the world around them. We will help them when they tire, Father. We will bring such course correction as the Lord speaks. We will not stop or back down or let these families stop or back down. Now let future leaders and prayers and speakers of righteousness and fighters of justice and bringers of mercy come from these. We present these children to the Lord as Samuel was presented. Let them grow together, a brotherhood in the house of the Lord, a sisterhood that believes and fights for a better world. Let them become those who change every room they enter for the better, for the glory of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Okay, as you go out, parents, we're just going to bless you. We also have a, a certificate for you to commemorate today, but also a scripture that our teams have prepared and prayed over for your children. So we're happy to hand those out. We bless you guys. All right, guys. We love you guys. I guess I should have had mom and dad and Arwen like kind of move down the line and pray for you. Next service, somebody remind me. But anyways, we love you guys, and we bless you in the name of Jesus. We bless your children in the name of Jesus. If you've never been to church, this seems all weird, but just like a big family reunion, and we like hugging each other. So, We believe also that blessing and the anointing of God passes through touch, and it passes through words. That's why it's extremely important to be speaking the words of the Lord over your child and touching them and blessing the children. And so bless your children in the name of Jesus. Bless them all in the name of Jesus. Hey, sweet. That's a sweet necklace. Bless the house, Lord. Bless these parents, Lord God, as they raise these children in Jesus' name. Bless them in Jesus' name, Lord. Look at these glasses. They never had cool glasses when I was a kid. 
All right, parents, you can uh, exit the stage this way. Okay, we have a, 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 de a child dedication certificate for you guys, and we love you guys. We also might, at the very end, keep an eye on where they're, if they're sitting by you, keep an eye on them at the end, because we might want you to just to gather around them and pray for them, just at the end of Pastor Aaron's message. Does that sound good? It's like a family time in the house of God. I want them to feel the strength of the house of the Lord. When you have a weak moment, the whole church isn't going to have a weak moment. We are strong in the Lord. goodness i am so glad that our kids are not this little anymore bless you guys we love you we feel sorry for you we will pray for you and... oh my goodness wow now i'd like to announce that pastor aaron is pregnant with triplets <laughs> not funny <laughs> what would you even do cry a lot cry she'd probably cry all right, we love you, parents. Okay, let me. Uh, I'm going to leave the stage uh, with Pastor Aaron. I want you to. This is this is mom of the church. I want you to respond and bless your bless your spiritual mom today. And the Lord has given her a word that's going to be awesome, and we're going to hear it, and uh, it's going to change something in our lives. All right. Okay. Go for it. Pastor. Well, if you know me, you know that this is not my happy place, and it's probably the worst Mother's Day gift I could be given from my family. <laughs> However, it is a privilege to be here on this stage sharing with you the word that God's given me today. And I just want to honor Pastor Corey right now, who's setting my timer so I don't go over. Um, but I want to honor him because bringing the kind of revelation that he does every single week to our church family is very, very rare. There are very few pastors that preach as much as Pastor Corey does. Um, a lot of people would love a mic to share their opinions about things, but that's not what Pastor Corey does. He goes to the Word, he goes to God in prayer, and sometimes God shifts things on him, and he's still responsive, and he, he brings what God speaks to him each week for us. So I just want to say thank you, Pastor Corey. Aren't you guys glad you have a pastor that will go to God for that? Uh, so we were church planters, so my jobs have kind of shifted and changed in the church. I did a lot of admin work, and then Renee came along, which was amazing, and I did kids work for a long time and then Tammy stepped in and with an amazing uh, team and I'm really grateful for that but right now I'm kind of uh, overseeing youth our youth team and developing our youth leaders as well as some pastoral care and leadership development in the church I do some planning and reviewing of administrative things still because I kind of still love it and honestly one of my biggest jobs is to actually free up Pastor Corey's time so that he can do the things he's called to do because if he can't do those things, we're all in a little bit of bra. We have trouble. We have trouble. And I'm glad that I don't have to do what he has to do every single week. But um, I'm grateful for this series on Sabbath because it's challenging me. It's called Reboot. And this is the second in, this, in the sermon series. If you didn't listen to last week yet, go back and check it out. Because I, I know you're going to find challenge in it as well. So today is called Telephone. How do we really hear from God for our families? Have you ever played the game of telephone? You know, where like they pass a, they say, they whisper something in someone's ear and they pass it down the line. And by the time it gets to the end of the line, it's really warped and twisted, especially if you start with something really awkward like this. Two tiny toads ate fat flying flies. You know, you start with something really weird like that and then all along the way it gets twisted. Kids are really distractible, so they see something and they're like, oh, squirrel. There's lots of noise usually around them and it's really hard to hear what people are saying and they get it a little messed up by the time it reaches the end. But sometimes we kind of get like that when we're trying to hear from God too. Things get twisted as they pass through our filters. Sometimes it's our thoughts, our minds. And it's funny when it's a game, but it's not so funny when it's the word of God and the revelation that we need because God is a speaking God. He wants to speak to us. Uh, but often I hear God's voice according to the way I am and not the way he is. And so today is about trying to figure out how do we hear God the way he is. And as parents, we need to teach our kids to hear God's voice, and we need revelation about how to train them up. God wants your child to hear something, but by the time it gets through your filters or their filters, sometimes there's just too much noise around us. Sometimes I think we're just too busy with all the important things. Sometimes I get like that, and Pastor Corey will say, just stop. Like, those things can wait. And I just think, well, if I just do this and this and this and this and this and this and this, then I'll rest. If I just do this and this and this and this and this and this, then I'll pray. Then I'll feel like it. I have a hard time doing anything until my kitchen is clean in the morning. That's just real. That's how it feels. But sometimes we won't lay down 
what we call the important things for the really important things to stop and listen. Can you imagine what it would be like if Google Maps operated like the telephone game? Like if it just started, it started changing down the line. You would just get so frustrated. I would get frustrated. I would pull over because I'd be so confused. Um, I don't love driving when I don't know where I'm going to begin with. But that's kind of what life turns into sometimes when it, things get twisted along the way. And today we're honoring mums. So all the mums in the house, I just want to say welcome to you. Our job is to steward the hearts of our children and then to hand them off to God. And today we're going to be talking from the story of Samuel. Samuel uh, was a boy who was a gift to his mother, Hannah, who started out not being able to have kids. She was barren, uh, but eventually she had a child. She prayed to God. God heard her prayer. She had a child, but she gave her child back to the Lord. And that is something that is very, very difficult for us to do as moms. Um, I grew up with a single mom, so my parents got divorced when I was in grade three. Uh, and so my mom had to work really, really hard to provide for my sister and I. Uh, but when I became a Christian, she took me to church, and she did her very best to give me a future uh, when she was probably really, really lonely and just trying to survive. And it's really hard to thrive and to help your kids thrive when you're trying to survive, and that's why you need God, and you need the rest that God gives you, and you need the revelation God gives you. So single moms, like, I'm proud of you. Don't give up. I know what it's like to grow up in that home. Um, and I know it can be hard, but you need to hear the voice of God, too. Uh, as a mom, my greatest desire is for, I have four girls, so they're 14, 16, 18, and 20, and they are the best, but my desire is for them to accurately, accurately hear the voice of the Lord. Accuracy is a big deal. I don't think kids are getting an accurate understanding of God today. Uh, speaking of accuracy, I'll tell you a funny story of my lack of accuracy. Okay, so around the time, baptism was just a few weeks ago, and it was amazing. But around that time, right before, one of my friends, Jules, sent me a message on Facebook and said, Hey, my daughter, Jaina, is ready to get baptized. What do I need to do? And I said, Oh, that's so exciting. I'm so excited for her. Let me know if she has any questions, if you want to chat. Um, here's the link where to sign up. And then I said this. I said, fill out the form. We shoot the heifers in the two weeks before. Crystal and Jesse and Arwen will be doing most of that. You guys, shoot the heifers. I, I meant shoot the baptism videos. So somehow videos got translated, auto-corrected to heifers in my text. And I didn't look over it. I just kind of was busy doing my own thing. I think I was making food or something like that, and I did not even look. And Pastor Corey happened to have it. My, I had my Facebook up on his laptop in his office, and he looked at it, and he's like, what is going on? <laughs> Jules and her family had a laugh. You know, they're like, You're, we're shooting heifers? What is going on? So, yeah, that's just another reason why Pastor Corey is in charge of things, because, yeah, <laughs> accuracy matters. And to remind me of my lack of accuracy, my wonderful staff found a plaque it actually says something about Herefords, but they don't know the difference between Herefords and Heifers because they're not farm girls. But it's a reminder in my office every day of my mistake. Yeah. Uh, and the reason details matter is because people matter and every word of God matters. Proverbs 29, 18 says this, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint. But blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. So revelation, or the divine guidance, the wisdom that we need, therefore, revelation brings restraint. Restraint is like keeping under control within the proper boundaries. So what it's saying here is blessed are those restrained by revelation. And sometimes you can think of restraint like this. So when you're driving a car, you have a steering wheel and you have a brake for a reason. Those things restrain the driving when you step on the gas. Can you imagine if you took them out, if you took the steering wheel out, if you took the brake out, and you hit the gas, you may get to where you're going, probably not, but you would definitely get there hurting a lot of people along the way and probably yourself. So there's two parts to Revelation. There's the part what to do and the part what not to do. So Revelation, it's vision, it's mission. When you have it and it's clear, you're not going to get sidetracked by the options that come up. You're not going to get sidetracked by sin or pain or the distractions. Uh, but in the scripture, it doesn't say restrain your kids by restraining them. So sometimes I think we just want to, like, restrain them. 
We actually have to restrain them with vision. We need the revelation. We need the vision for them. No. So there's times when we got to restrain our kids, obviously, if they're in the grocery store pulling open boxes of Oreos and eating them. There are moments like that. But think, okay, back to a driving analogy. Think of it like this. You can't just park the car in the garage because you're panicking because it's really hard. I mean, it's scary for me to teach my kids to drive. Um, sometimes I think as parents, we want to just pull our kids out of life and park in the garage because society's kind of insane. But the reality is we got to actually teach our kids how to weave in and out of traffic and even how to deal with accidents that happen because they're colliding every single day with insane thoughts, insane philosophies, insane worldviews about design, about happiness, about morality. These things are colliding with them and we need to help them navigate through it. So we need to spend our time on teaching them, hey, where are you going? Like, where are you going? And how are you gonna get there? Our kids need to live lives on mission and with purpose because their destiny matters and they need to keep moving forward. So revelation then is our job. This is what restrains them and this is what gives them vision for their future. Um, so in the story of Samuel, we're gonna be looking a little bit, and if you're not familiar with it, it's found in 1 Samuel, kind of the first few chapters of it. But Eli the prophet was the, the guy that Hannah brought her child back to. He was the man who, the priest in the uh, temple who she, uh, who she brought, she was praying, and he blessed her and said, no, you're gonna have a child. And so when, she, when the boy was probably about three years old, she brought the boy back to the temple and dedicated him to the house and said, here, train him up in these ways. Um, but Eli also had a problem. See, he had sons of his own. And his sons were unrestrained sons. That's, that's the word the Bible says, that same word that we're talking about from Proverbs. He had unrestrained sons who were wicked. They were doing it right in the church and they were actually causing people to not want to come to the house of God, to stop worshiping because of the things that they were doing. And we say, like, did he not train them with the revelation? Like, these guys, were, these guys were from the line of Aaron. They were the Levites. They were supposed to be the ones that were doing the priestly duties in the house of God. Remember, where there's no revelation, people cast off restraint. So did he not have revelation and teach this to his kids? Or did he train them with his own thoughts instead of God's thoughts? Maybe he didn't ever teach them the why. Like, hey, your future matters, but it's going to be sacrifices today for the future ahead. They were doing whatever they want. They were not restrained. And I think sometimes we think of strong people as people that get to do whatever they want. That's not what a strong person is. You look at someone like Pastor Richard, he's a very strong person. But he's strong because he's restrained by revelation. Then your church is restrained by the revelation God has given us. So um, Pastor Corey heard the Lord say, a life saved is worth everything. And we say it so often because it matters to us. And that's why we can say, you know what? We're not going to get bogged down with church people problems at the expense of someone that needs Jesus. Yeah. Pastor Corey didn't make those things up. He heard it. He had the revelation from God. And that's what restrains us from being distracted by these other things. So imagine waking up and, showing, and God showing you what your child needed in the morning. In your prayer times, I, I think of Pastor Beth. She prayed for her kids. She got specific scriptures for her kids to pray over them, to believe over them, to speak over them. And um, that's something that you guys as moms can do. As parents, you can do that and speak these words over your kids. I had another friend, Pastor Amy. You might meet her in a few weeks. Um, her and her husband are pastors in Grand Prairie. She was struggling with a kid, and she tried all the usual techniques for parenting. Everything. She tried everything. She said, God, nothing is working. I cannot get through to my son. And then she went to God in prayer, and she heard something very specific and very weird. It was, take away his hat. Okay, and so you're not going to read a parenting book that says, take away his hat. But she heard the revelation because she went to God in prayer for it, and that was the thing that worked for her son, that if, hey, if this behavior continues, we're going to take away your hat. And it totally did a shift in him. But that, I know, it doesn't make sense, but that's the revelation that God gave her. So parents, we need to be going to the Lord to get the revelation to know how to train up our kids in the way they should go. Here's the thing. It's God's revelation to your kids that's the goal, not yours. It's God's voice saying, do this and don't do that. Because God's path can only be found by God's voice. But have you ever misheard God about something? His word's always true, but sometimes we hear it passed down that telephone line. 
of my filters. So for me, sometimes it's like selfish ambition. No, I, I really want it this way though. Or fear of failure or apathy. I'm, you know, I'm kind of, I'm not feeling it right now. And things get passed down and they get twisted and stuck in our minds as something very different, kind of like it did in the Garden of Eden. Remember when the serpent came? When the serpent came, he twisted things. He took the word of God and twisted it a little bit. And there was something within Eve that took what was twisted and acted on it. When things get stuck in our minds that are very differently than what God speaks, we get into trouble. And, you know, Pastor Corey tells a funny story about um, one of his old girlfriends, obviously, before me. Um, but he thought God spoke to him that he was supposed to marry his last girlfriend. He thought that he heard something God didn't say because he wasn't interested in dating just somebody. He thought dating was dumb unless you were planning on marrying, but he wanted to date. And so he heard something different because it's what he wanted to hear. And I'm glad he didn't marry her. I think you're probably glad. Are you glad? <laughs> and you know what? Besides, Pastor Beth didn't like her, and I'm pretty sure she loves me. So... But, but for years, I couldn't clearly hear God, and even my husband for that matter, because I heard things through the filter of rejection, and they weren't rejecting me. I did the rejecting most of the time, but it's tricky when correction sounds like, I hate you, or you're not good enough, because God can only protect you if he can correct you. Here's the other part of it. I used to hate how secure Pastor Corey was because I wasn't secure. But I, it was his parents and his church family that really taught him here to hear the voice of the Lord. And there was something in me that was agitated by that because I, I didn't have that security. I didn't know how to find that revelation. So revelation is to know what to do in a situation. Restraint is to know what not to do. And it does bring security, and it deals with the fear of what people are going to think and our image and all of those things. But it doesn't come through evaluation. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith is heaven's currency. Faith must be the filter that we hear accurately through. Um, human evaluation is not going to bring heaven's destiny to your family. And the thing I love about Sabbath is it just does that shift. It shifts our minds into neutral so that you can hear, you get out of evaluation mode, into worship mode, and you just say, God, evaluate me. Like, I'm here. What could I change to glorify you more? Am I doing okay? And that's what our Sabbath rest does. That's why it's so important to come and worship in the house of the Lord and just to have some time to rest and really hear. God wants your child to be a voice to the nation, to walk into rooms, to change them, to not be victims, to literally bring God's wisdom and power into places of hopelessness. That's what God wants for our kids, but we must bring them to God's house and teach them about Sabbath and about hearing the voice of the God. Unrestrained people always destroy everything they build. The Bible says, unless the Lord builds up the house, they labor in vain who build it. And you think about Eli's sons, they were unrestrained and they were destroying what God was trying to build. And God actually dealt with them and he, he actually destroyed them. So the backstory of Samuel was that his mother was barren, and I know a day like today would have been a day that was really painful to someone like Hannah. And I know there's people in this room that are probably feeling much like that. But there's something that was probably even more painful for Hannah, and that was giving this gift, this child that she had, back to the Lord. The very child that God gave her, she had to give back. And Samuel became a prophet to the nation of, for decades. He was actually the one that ended up anointing King David. Here's the thing. Hannah knew that her child, this gift, needed a different teacher for him to hear the revelation from God for his destiny. His destiny wasn't going to be in her house. It was actually in God's house. And it wasn't for her glory, but it was for God's glory. And it wasn't for everyone to think, she's such a great mom. But it was for God's glory, to, for people to know that God's a good God. So she did what very few moms are willing to do. She brought her child to the house of God. See, everybody wants a Samuel, but not everybody's going to pay the price. Not everyone is willing to teach their kids to pay the price too. So let's read in 1 Samuel 3 a little bit from the scripture. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel, so by now he's maybe around 11 years old. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. So they weren't hearing his revelation. 
They, weren't, uh, they were actually being oppressed by their enemies, the Philistines, right now. And one night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, I think blind physically, but also the revelation was gone from him, um, he had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. And suddenly the Lord called out, Samuel! Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. And that would totally be me. I do not like to be woken up in the night. I would be like, get out of here, go away, I want to sleep. But what I want you to note here is that sometimes, to your child's ears, you might sound like God. Sometimes you might sound like God. Be careful that you don't accept that mantle. Your rules aren't the same as God's rules. Your ways aren't the same as God's ways. Okay, verse 6. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. And again, Samuel got up and he went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? No, I didn't call you. My son, Eli, said, go back to bed. See, Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never heard a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time. And once more, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. Did you call me? Then Eli realized it was the Lord who was calling the boy. Duh, like... I'd probably be a little groggy too at that time. But so he said to Samuel, go and lie down again. And if someone calls again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed and the Lord came and called us before Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel replied, speak, your servant is listening. Worship team, you guys can come on up now. But this is the time when the Lord places the burden of a nation on an 11 year old boy. He actually speaks that Samuel's legacy through his sons was going to be destroyed because they were wicked. But there's one piece in here that's a little bit redeeming. God actually gave Eli a second chance with Hannah's son. And that might be you. That might be you. There may be a second chance for you. Maybe, you're, maybe your kids have walked away. Maybe you regret some of the things. Maybe you didn't know Christ when you were raising your kids. But you have an opportunity to pour out to serve in kids, to serve in youth, to pour into other people, into another generation. <laughs> See, Eli did not restrain his sons. And we don't know, maybe he was too proud to ask for help. He probably didn't go to venue kids, like your kids are going to go to. He might have been an indulgent parent that just said yes to everything. He might have been passive and permissive when he should have been training them up and correcting them. He might have reasoned with them instead of bringing them the correction they needed. They might have not had youth leaders in their lives to help keep them on track. He might have been giving them his revelation, his voice, instead of God's voice. But his failure showed that he gave greater honor to his kids than he did to the Lord, the voice of the Lord. And maybe he adopted the belief that is so common today that it's better to let our kids find their own way. That is not biblical parenting. They need you, parents. So when we're teaching our kids to drive, which I never did because I'm a terrible teacher and my kids just panic because I panic, Pastor Corey is way better than that, and now Grandpa has graduated to driver's training. Thank you, Grandpa. But we direct our kids when we're teaching them how to drive, right? We don't just say, just figure it out, express yourselves. <laughs> do it however you want, it's okay. No, no, they need, to, they need to know how to do it so that they can be restrained and not, so you don't have to go and buy a new car, really. And guys, we need revelation for our kids. And that's not going to happen if we're too busy with all of the important details of parenting. And we don't make room for God to speak to us. We don't go to him in the morning. We don't go to him, you know, on our, on our Sabbath, on our day of rest, and, and ask him to speak into our family. And I, what I love about Sabbath is it just reminds us we need to stop. We need, we're not in charge. He's in control. We need to hear God's voice. We need to train them up. And so like that ceasing from the ordinary things is just a great reminder that it's him. We need his extraordinary voice to speak into our lives. We can't schedule our way into significance, trying to do what only God can do. We need his revelation. Even if it's as simple as taking away the kid's hat. <laughs> but we're not going to hear it if we don't stop and listen. And I need to stop seeking to be what only God can be, ever present and ever powerful. So a Sabbath rest becomes a regular, timely reminder to us that we're not God and we need his revelation to parent our kids well. 
We need to bring our kids to the house of the Lord to find their destiny. And we just can't keep trying to build their lives our way. We need his way. We need his word. We need his revelation in our hearts. So let's pray. Father, would you just remind us that we have a great privilege and a great responsibility with the kids and the spiritual kids that you've entrusted to us, Lord. May we bring them to the house of the Lord that they can learn to hear your voice. May we go to you and find the revelation that we need and hear your voice clearly, not get tied down by our own thoughts, our own desires, our own ways. We wouldn't raise unrestrained kids that destroy what you're trying to build. Help us to stop being too busy to pray and to listen to you. May we not be passive. May we not hold back and hope that our kids are going to turn out okay, but know that with you, you will give us the word. You will give us the revelation that our kids can thrive in the destiny that you have for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, was that good? Um, if you saw a parent... Uh, if you saw a parent sit close to you um, that are, are getting their children dedicated to the Lord, can we just pray a blessing over them as the family? I want to say, parents, to every parent here, the best revelation that I ever hear from the Lord is when I allow the Lord to father me and when I go to the Holy Spirit, who's like the mom of the Trinity. And I go and I say, speak, Lord, your servant is, is listening. And when I take time out, we don't pray for our kids as much as you think. We pray for them every day, but we don't pray for our kids as much. What we do is we worship the Lord, and the Lord speaks to us, even when we're worshiping or reading the Bible, or the Lord speaks to us about our children, even when we're not asking about our children, because God knows what's best. And so I just want to challenge every parent with that. Go to the Lord in the morning. Take the Sabbath day. The Lord will speak. He is a speaking God. Let's clean out those ears and let's pray a blessing over every every person. If you're close by, I mean, if you're okay, just be in, just have a hand on your shoulder. Just reach out towards somebody who's around. This is a family time. So, Father, we bless every family, every mother and father and every little boy and every little girl. And we, we command, not the Lord, for the Lord's word is the command, but we command that, that their lives will be lived in complete compliance to the scriptures, to the living word of the Lord, to daily re revelation, to moment by moment revelation that they would know in those moments at school, they would know, no, I can't hang out with that person. I better hang out with this person. Oh, I better not go there. I better go here. I better not listen to this. I better listen to that. And, and I better not watch this. I better watch that. Father, we pray for the Lord to be the father of our children, for the Holy Spirit to be their guide, their encouragement, Lord God. And let every parent know here today that they're not alone. We are with them in this way. And Father, we love the great name of our Lord Jesus. May Jesus be Lord, not just Savior, but Lord of our children. And may our children rise up to be godly in the house of God that challenge us and challenge our generation and say, why have you not served and, and done everything that the Lord has told you to do? Challenge us to get, get off the couch and to serve in the house of the Lord and to serve our, our neighbors in our city. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.